Coming up on One Detroit, the story of deported father Jorge Garcia takes a new turn, plus a look at the biggest development projects in Detroit. Also ahead, Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson analyze what is quickly becoming a pricey Senate race and then a Chinese dish uniquely Michigan. I'm Christy McDonald at Burt's Marketplace in Eastern Market. One Detroit is coming up. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund. Business Leaders for Michigan. And by... The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Great to have you with us. We're here at Burt's Marketplace in Eastern Market. Chances are you've come here for the jazz or the outdoor barbecue on the weekends at the Cool Joint. Thanks so much to them for having us. A lot coming up for you on the show, including a celebration for one Lincoln Park family. The story of deported father Jorge Garcia takes a turn. We will have that coming up. Then some politics. Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson take on what is fast becoming a pricey U.S. Senate race in Michigan. Plus, John Gallagher gives us the top development projects to watch for in downtown Detroit in 2020. And almond boneless chicken, a favorite on your Chinese takeout menu. But did you know it's really a Michigan thing? We track down the origins of ABC coming up. But we are starting off with one Lincoln Park family's deportation battle. Jorge Garcia's story made national news when he was deported two years ago after living here in the U.S. for 30 years. We were with the family on that January day as part of a One Detroit closer look at immigration policies that changed during the Trump administration, how the system works and the families the policies affect. Well, after two years of separation, paperwork and heartache, Jorge is now back in Michigan with his family. What did you miss most? Basically everything. People just have to believe that when you file the proper paperwork and everything, you can come back if you don't have a criminal record. The Garcia's living room in Lincoln Park, a Spanish-speaking television network here from Miami this week to report on Jorge's homecoming. Yeah. I don't understand any of that. Stuff. None of us do. None of us do. January 14th, 2018, Jorge and his wife Cindy tried to explain the pain of knowing he would be gone in a matter of hours. Lord, we ask you on the 11th hour, make a miracle happen and keep our husband and father with us. It's a nightmare that you're waking up to and it, it's hard to explain because it's, it's like a funeral but there's no body. Loving, gracious God. Brought to the U.S. illegally as a child 30 years ago, Jorge made a home here, got married, had a job, paid taxes, and did not have a criminal record. But he missed being qualified by a year to be considered part of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA program. He was brought here as a child, not as an adult. But according to the judge, when we had a hearing with the immigration judge, he said at 16, you know right from wrong, and at 16, he should have went back to his country of origin. Despite years of appeals, trying to obtain citizenship and work with immigration groups, on January 15, 2018, Jorge said a painful goodbye to his family at Metro Airport. Two years later, Jorge is back home in Lincoln Park with his two children and his wife, Cindy. He flew home to the U.S. on Christmas Day. It seemed forever for us. It was an agony. 
there's a lot of depression, PTSD, anxiety, because you you know something's going to happen, but you don't know when. So the waiting is what's like, oh, I just hurry up and get here. And it took, for us, it took forever. Just last week, almost two years to the day he left, Jorge is now a lawful permanent resident of the U.S. on his way to U.S. citizenship. In three years, I'm going to basically start studying for, for the citizen test so I can become a citizen. I'm medically retired, so my life doesn't change much. His is trying to find a job to able to support us, and that's what we're in the process of doing, is trying to put out applications out there so he can get a steady job. His wife, Cindy, vows to continue to be an advocate for families who are separated and help them navigate an ever-changing immigration system. Yes, he's back. We're grateful, but the fight continues because we got to bring back the other families that are separated because it's just as important for them to be together as my family is. Well, we've done extensive reporting on immigration issues affecting people across Michigan. Just go to our website, OneDetroitPBS.org, to see it. All right, turning now to some politics, and you can't escape it in Michigan this time of year. Some new polling out. Plus, let's take a look at that pricey Senate race. Say hi to Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of American Black Journal. Hey, guys, little politics. We've got a boisterous crowd behind us, I'm we sure. <laughs> but, They're all uh, talking about Meghan and Harry. Uh, is that what it is? That's I what think it you're is. obsessed with that, Nolan. I, I, He's paying more attention than anyone I know. Locked in. <laughs> well, I think it's because we can all relate to bad conference calls, and if Megan was calling into that meeting, I can only imagine what that was well, like. Well, we can also all relate to <laughs> dysfunctional family yes. dynamics, right? Is, yeah. Like you, you fight with your family about all kinds of stuff. You say you want to move away, and your grandma's like, "Hold on a second, you didn't ask my permission." <laughs> oh, it's it, it's not good, but it yeah, but it definitely and these is one of those never things. Never leave the nest. <laughs> these millennials. Never leave, right. that's, that's right, Nolan Finley. Just send him an email. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look. Some of the some polling came out. It was a Detroit News Channel 4 Glenn Gariff poll um, taking a look at where we stand right now. What stood out to you, Nolan? Well, what stood out to me is that I would have thought that the Democrats would be performing much, much better against Donald Trump. I mean, he's had a pretty tough strap, um, stretch with impeachment. Michigan went heavily Democrat in 2018. And if you look at the spread, except for um, Joe Biden, I think he was behind seven to Joe Biden. The rest were pretty much within the margin of error. He's very well positioned at the start of this presidential campaign. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, well, number one, it all, uh, with polling now, it all depends on how you weight it, right? And I don't know, was it Democrat plus what? I mean, yeah. it depends on whether you think this will be a Democrat seven. plus seven. Yeah. Um, that, that's pretty high, actually. Uh, if, if it was that high and the, the numbers were that wrong, close. I thought it was plus seven. Uh, but it really does depend on the turnout, right? Uh, how many Democrats who sat home in 2016 uh, will show up in 2020? And that's, that's the ball game here in terms of the presidential race. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump won because so many Democrats did not turn out for Hillary Clinton. Uh, you had 20,000 votes disappear in the city of Detroit. That's double what the statewide margin was. If those folks who had voted in 2012 had voted in 2016, he wouldn't have won. So it really is about which Democrat can get and Democrats. Right, up and I think you saw a report out today from the voting. Free Press talking about how their expected turnout in Michigan is supposed to be very, very high. And, you know, and that turnout that favors hurts Democrats very well. I mean, yeah. um, Trump actually got less votes in Michigan in winning than Mitt Romney did in losing, mm -hmm. and John McCain mm -hmm. did in losing, about the same as McCain. It was, it was a very um, traditional and normal Republican vote, yeah. but the Democratic vote was just fell off the charts yeah. in 2016. Yeah. Well, and you also had this overvote in Macomb, which helped him enormously. Uh, it, it helped did, him win but, that county, but which overall, the Barack Obama had won. In it within its twice. normal range. Yeah. The Democratic the, the volume, vote was yes. well low. No, you're right. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Senate race. Um, are we starting to see a lot more attention put on yeah. there? And really the staggering amount of money yeah. that's being put It'll into be this an race. And just race. so what, the last quarter, uh, John James raised a million more than Senator Gary Peters yeah. did. What does that mean to you when you look at fundraising, Stephen? It's, I mean, it's very early, and I think it's too early to project what that means for the race. I mean, it means that, uh, it principally means that nationally, I believe, Republicans think this is a seat that they have a, a shot this is a race at. That they're this putting is a candidate money into. that they like to to try to beat Gary Peters. I, I think uh, John James is more appealing nationally than he is locally. 
Uh, I think he has a harder time selling people in the state on him as a Senate candidate, as just as he did against Debbie Stabenow. Uh, but uh, but Republicans nationally, I think, think this is a this is a good this is a good race to bet on uh, this early. But and didn't, he do, at, didn't he do better against Debbie Stabenow than people thought he well, was Well, I mean, it was, it was six points. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a razor thin, but he starts this race only four points behind mm -hmm. uh, Gary Peters. Uh, Gary Peters has got a UAW problem because, you know, the UAW is heavily behind Gary Peters, UAW leadership. Uh, you've got the corruption scandal in that union. I wrote about that. Uh, this week. So do you think um, that's going to make a difference in political clout for the UAW? I do, I do, and I think the rank and file is not necessarily this time going to follow the advice of their leadership because they're angry, mistrustful of that leadership. It's a place uh, or a group of voters that, as a Republican, you don't necessarily usually have a shot at, right. but um, John James can exploit that this time. Yeah, I, the one thing that people underestimate about Gary is the relationship he has with those very voters, mm -hmm. uh, especially in places like Macomb uh, uh, and going up into the thumb. Uh, he, he, they love Gary out there. They love the motorcycle that he rides. They love the way that he can kind of relate to their working class backgrounds. He does really, really strongly in that area of the state, and John James uh, did not in in uh, the last race against Debbie Stabenow. I think that could end up being the difference uh, uh, in November is that John James is unable to close the deal with these people who are, you know, uh, understandably upset with their union leadership, but they do like Gary and they have a relationship Well, there's with an him opportunity already. for him there because he could, James can do something Peters can't. He can attack the UAW leadership oh, sure. while supporting the reforms right. that the Reagan file want. Yeah. Um, direct elections, accountability for spending. Gary Peters can't talk about that and at the same time take checks uh, from the UAW It'd leadership. Be tougher, right. uh, but James can. He can speak to the Do you think voters. this would be the most expensive Senate race that we've that we've seen? Well, oh, each absolutely. each time it's the most uh, it expensive, just keeps right? Getting it just keeps getting uh, more and more. I mean, uh, uh, the the cost of uh, the things that that people think matter in these races just keeps going up, and people's willingness to put money in is huge. The the other question will be though uh, on the Democratic side, the Bloomberg effect. Uh, uh, um, if he doesn't get the nomination, what he's promising to do is to support uh, candidates that will help the Democrats win the Senate and get Trump out of office. He did that in Virginia in 2018. It made a huge difference. Uh, I don't, wouldn't put Michigan off of the radar for somebody like that if, no. if that comes to pass, if things here are close. That's money that could come into the state that we haven't seen before, and the volume would... Uh, would be impressive. All right, so um, this time of year, are you a little bored? More bored than usual, Nolan? There's no auto show right well, now. This, this is this was auto show and week. Look, and look at how nice the weather I'm is. Not bored. It's Southern actually night. warm, though. I think there's supposed to get sm it's snow nice this break. week. But yeah, I mean, it, it feels funny. I mean, because normally you'd come back, you'd get a week off from the holidays, mm -hmm. and boom, you're right into the auto show. You know, we got to wait a few months now. And it's a long slog. And we don't know yeah. what we're waiting well, for. Well, it's no, a we're long starting slog to hear a little between bit, here and Easter. A couple you know? more details, though, on what's yeah. going to be happening in June. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's, it's sounding fun. I mean, they're going to do that um, at the um, Opera House or, or Music Hall in that space on, on Madison there. They're going to do the German and uh, European, German and English car show. Yeah, so that, if you want to get close to Ferraris, you yeah, can. I mean, yeah, and so cool. they're going to be yeah. able, they're really focusing on the outdoors that week and bringing people out and around the city, which will be different. It could be exciting uh, if it don't rain. So you, I was just going to say, so you're <laughs> counting down the days. I know you enjoy it. I, I, I think it's a nice break uh, from the show because I think the, the weather is always such an awful part of it. Um, and I am excited for summer. I think it'll be different. and. There'll be things that we didn't have a chance to I'm do I'm excited before. for to be able to show off the city in a different way, too, yeah, because, I mean, you know, you do go from yeah. hotel to convention right. hall to hotel right. to airport Come out to the in January. In June and You'll be able to really experience a lot month. of that. But there is this thing. now winter void here where there's absolutely nothing going on. It's quiet. And it's nice. I don't know. It's we're you just get, don't like people. That's we're going to get cabin fever here. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. You know, if you've experienced downtown recently, you know the amount of construction that's happening on major projects, from the bridge to a to the old Hudson site. Well, we checked in with John Gallagher, former free press columnist and business writer and current author with a keen eye for urban development, to give us a sense of the biggest projects to watch this year in Detroit. 
in 2020, um, we're seeing a slight uh, pause in the really rapid redevelopment of Detroit's greater downtown that we saw the last several years. We've had, uh, you know, prices are rising and construction costs are rising. Uh, there's some labor shortages, skilled trade shortages. So uh, what we're doing is taking a slight pause now, I think, in, um, in this rapid redevelopment that we've seen recently. But at the same time, we're, we're sort of bringing to fruition a lot of the smaller projects, a lot of the uh, restaurants and retail and so on um, that we've been hearing about are coming online. So new apartment projects are coming online. Uh, some new restaurants are opening. We're seeing the new Valet Park at Water Beach on the East Riverfront that just opened. The Joe Lewis Greenway is, is in the works. Uh, the new Joseph Compound Greenway uh, is going to open soon along the, on the east side down to the, from the neighborhoods down to the riverfront. So a lot of these smaller projects we've been hearing about are uh, beginning to come online. Uh, and I think that's, that's exciting. Between mid to late 2022 and the end of 24, you're going to see some really region redefining projects opening in the city. For a long time we thought Detroit was sort of at the end of history. You know, it was done. It was toast. You know, everybody had left. All the businesses had left. Not true, of course, but that was sort of the image. And I think this reminds people that these things can happen. Uh, building a new bridge to Canada, uh, any kind of major infrastructure project is very hard to do for a lot of reasons. And we're getting that done. We, you know, we found a way to get that done. The Michigan Central Station, as we've said, just uh, it, the, the symbol to the world of Detroit's downfall now becomes this amazing new center of future mobility research, the place where we reinvent electric cars and self-driving cars. The Hudson site downtown, which was a symbol of Detroit's downfall for many years, is now being redone as what should be if this, this amazing new building, you know, architectural icon. And I think the, the failed jail site off Gratiot downtown now becomes the U of M Innovation Center, where we have a thousand graduate students from U of M, the best and the brightest graduate students, sort of reinventing the wheel uh, right there in downtown Detroit. And I think that's going to help enormously uh, develop our tech talent base. And the West Riverfront Park, uh, you know, we all remember when the riverfront was, was cement silos and, uh, and it was hard to get down to it and it really was not a very pleasant place at all. And now, thanks to the Riverfront Conservancy and all the efforts of the city and many, many people, it's this really pretty wonderful Riverfront Promenade and the West Riverfront, which has been industrial and rail yards over the last 200 years, now it's gonna be this amazing, uh, very welcoming, family-friendly family uh, park facility. So I think, I think all these are really gonna change the, the, the narrative on Detroit uh, in important ways. And finally, let's celebrate something uniquely Michigan, but maybe you didn't even realize it. If you're a fan of Chinese food around here, chances are you've had almond boneless chicken. But where did this dish start? That's what one Detroit senior producer, Bill Kubota, wanted to know. So take a look at what he found. Go missing, so we are here to get the last whatever they got. Last supper. At Kim's. Yeah, last supper at Kim's. Last Chinese supper at Kim's. Kim's here in Troy, Michigan since 1974, closing for good. What's your favorite dish? Sweet and sour chicken <laughs> and egg drop soup. <laughs> How about almond, you? Almond boneless chicken. Yeah. What do you know about almond boneless chicken? I don't know very much about it, but Kim's makes the best that I've ever had. <laughs> this is an old line Chinese restaurant one of Metro Detroit's mainstays these past 50 years. First booth on the right hand side. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. I knew we would get busier, but I just didn't know how busy we would get, how many people wanted to come and say goodbye. Margaret Yee and her siblings spent their lifetimes building this business, but the next generation of Yees have other career plans. Hi. Oh, now I can give you a hug. <laughs> At least I have a breathing minute. I know, I felt so bad. Yeah. Kim's features Cantonese cuisine. You might say Detroit-style Cantonese. With a signature dish, something the next generation Chinese-Americans who worked in their parents' restaurants know all about. 
Almond chicken is most definitely like the king of Chinese food. I would, I would say for Michigan Chinese, almond chicken is the most iconic. Everybody knows what ABC means, almond boneless chicken. We would always put ABC on it so we could differentiate what we were packing in the carryout. Lots of customers now they put the order, I want ABC. It's a Michigan thing. ABC's origins go back to southeastern China, not far from Canton now called Guangzhou, <laughs> on the Pearl River Delta sits the city of Toisan. Toisan, not pronounced like it's spelled. Toisan is like where the huge emigration patterns happen. So our uncle came to Michigan with, and it's like, why didn't you go to San Francisco? Here? <laughs> and they landed in Cass Corridor in Chinatown. And so then, of course, he brings over his like seven siblings. And now my dad's side was all here, but they're all Toisan. Many decades ago, career paths for Chinese in Detroit were limited washing clothes or serving food. My grandfather said, well, I try laundry, but when the business is slow, I have nothing to eat. But at least if I worked in the restaurant when business is slow, I still have all these food I can eat. I won't go hungry. Detroit's Chinatown restaurants shared recipes and adapted them for American tastes. Then the restaurants moved to the suburbs where ABC became a top seller. At the Golden Crown in Bloomfield Hills, Connie Lowe has been making it for more than 40 years. The older generation, they live in Michigan, they come out with this. Does anybody know who came up with it first? And that's, that's the question. Yeah, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> don't know. Well, there's some ideas of like which restaurant might have started it, but I don't know. I would never say. When they first started the almond boneless chicken, they didn't call it almond boneless chicken. They call it washu guy. A washu guy? Yeah, mm -hmm. we heard that many, many of times throughout the years. <laughs> yeah. Saying washu guy was a little too hard for a lot of people. And actually, washu doesn't really translate to almond boneless chicken. <laughs> but looking at the dish, people were able to describe it. And I think that's probably what happened. A simple presentation. No secret ingredients, but a key one, cornstarch, which will help give ABC its crunch. The reason I put the little cornstarch because I want to make sure they absorb all the water so it won't be so watery. Then comes the breading and the frying. So I deep on the breading and make sure the breading is even. It's all in the technique of frying the chicken and the right temperature, when to bring it out. It's all in the technique. The chopped fried chicken rides on a bed of lettuce. And then we put gravy on top. Then some onions. At the Golden Crown, they used to add slivered almonds until Connie began to worry about customers with nut allergies. Now, no almonds. And no loss for ABC enthusiast, Ro Roosh. Now let me demonstrate. This chicken, when you go to open it up, is actually white and soft, and it is not dried out. ABC comes with many dining options. So I always like to put it on my rice so I have the sauce on it. Everybody different. Some exactly. people ask for more lettuce. Some people say, I don't want no lettuce. I don't put it on top. I always put the rice on the side. So that's two different ways that you can have yeah. it. Yeah. But also in the gravy, there's water chestnuts for crunchiness. Mm -hmm. So you have more texture than just the chicken and it's the good. batter. It's still crispy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just kind of gain the craving and you love, like, you end up loving the food that's there. But then your parents tell you, like, uh, that's not real Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> no. How about Chinese American food? Susie Moy had to leave home to learn the real story about ABC. When she moved to San Francisco, she was expecting almond chicken out there. And when she got out there, she's like, the Chinese food's not the same out here as it is back oh, home. You, I can't tell you how many restaurants was, one, you would ask about almond chicken. They're like, oh yeah, we got almond chicken. And we're like, is it deep fried? Or you would try to describe it. They're like, oh no, not deep fried. And then. And then sometimes they would say that they have it was deep fried, but it would be like a stir fry. So I have a lot of customers, they moved to Chicago, they moved to Florida. Whenever I come back to visit, they always have an almond chicken because of these, they don't have it anywhere else. Well, it's kind of like Detroit pizza. People really didn't know about Detroit pizza. We had our own pizza. It wasn't just New York or Chicago. 
Like square pizza and Coney Island hot dogs, our cuisine has been discovered in other places. Almond boneless chicken, you can also find it in Columbus, Ohio. So there is something those Buckeyes love about Michigan after all. All right, thanks, Bill. Somebody to think about the next time you order. And that'll do it for One Detroit. Thanks so much for joining me. And thanks to Burt's Marketplace for having us. To find out more, just head to OneDetroitPBS.org. I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you next week. Take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, Business Leaders for Michigan, and by The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.